Hello and welcome to my talk on TensorFlow training on the JVM. Let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Christoph Henkelmann. I'm CTO and founder of Divisio. Divisio is an artificial intelligent intelligence, uh, I hope it's also, also an artificial intelligence, but it's an artificial intelligence company from Cologne. We produce AI software. Um, I'm someone who pref much prefers static typing over dynamic typing, which is uh, kind of one of the reasons for this talk. So I'm not the biggest Python fan. And um, I started my pro programming career on the JVM. So this is like where I really feel at home. And also as someone who starts his own businesses and uh, yeah, is self-employed, um, I'm very pragmatic. So for me, it's about getting things done. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to have working software. Um, my private Twitter hashtag is at chenkelmann, and for more AI-focused news, it's uh, Divisio AI is our company Twitter handle. Okay, what do we actually want to achieve? Um, so assume you have all these nice data sources, databases, XML files, cloud stuff, you name it and um, you have an existing business and uh, existing IT infrastructure and that works really nicely with Java. So you have all your uh, data access code, everything is already there in place to use. But now you want to do machine learning and for reasons which we will discuss in a moment, you want to use TensorFlow for those. So this is what we want to uh, uh, get done. We have the virtual machine Inside the virtual machine, we have our working Java code, and we want that code to work with TensorFlow. But why Java? I mean, um, just a quick review. How many Java programmers are in the room? OK, so I make this fast. <laughs> um, because what I hear, especially at this conference, when you talk to ML people who purely ML, uh, do purely ML, they all do Python and say, Java is so slow. So no, don't use Java. Java is so verbose, oh my god. And Java is not cool, OK? So first of all, quick reminder. I don't need to tell you Java is fast. Java is really fast. I found this nice paper from, I think it's last year. I forgot to add the, the year. And they actually um, they evaluated, based on certain programming tasks from the programming language shootout, the, uh, the time, the different, uh, the average uh, time the, the languages use and the energy consumption they have and the memory consumption. And we see here the top four language, uh, one, two, uh, top five languages, C, Rust, C++, Ada, very surprising, uh, didn't know that's still a thing, and Java. And we see that the difference between C and Java is not very large. And here we see Python. Okay. And uh, also, everybody's talking about global warming, yeah? Using Python melts glaciers. So, okay, Java is fast. Um, it was really slow 25 years ago. You know, first virtual machines were just uh, bad interpreters on the Pente uh, Pentium processor. That was really slow. But by now we have highly optimized JIT compilation. I don't want to go into depth here, but it's really fast. And um, in, in highly optimized code, you get half of C performance. But if you just do everyday programming tasks where you don't spend ages optimizing, you're often faster than C, C++. We have experienced this in real pro uh, projects where actually the prototype in Java was faster than the C++ code. Um, Java is not always uh, verbose. It can actually be nice. Um, if you, ah, oh yeah, that's the example I have. This is Enterprise Hello World from GitHub. Okay, um, this is actually a Hello Java Hello World that follows enterprise best practices. So there's a point, you know, to Java being verbose. But uh, if if uh, if it was before Java 1.8 and we have uh, enterprise best practices, that's true. I admit it. That's true. But um, it's not anymore. If you write proper Java uh, 1.8, you have a very nice functional style, or as we do it, we actually use Kotlin. So I, this t uh, talk, I, I will say Java. When I say Java, I mean the JVM. And actually, actually, we use Kotlin because it's just so much nicer to use. So this simply, for uh, just this example, reads a CSV file, turns it into floats. It's just one line. Read the file, turn the lines into floats. So quick. So you don't get this shorter in Python, I think. OK, Java is not cool. <laughs> that may be true. OK, can't do much about it. Um, but Kotlin is. So that's why we use Kotlin. Um, why else Java? Um, those of you who know Java, Java has this immensely solid, well-tested, well-documented, widely 
uh, adopted ecosystem. Just a few examples of stuff. The Spring Framework with Java immediately you have access to Android and a whole other platform. Um, and th you have all the good stuff that the Apache Foundation does. So this is a very, very healthy ecosystem. And it's simply so that the enterprise world runs on Java. Okay, the enterprise world doesn't run on Python or Ruby. Cool startups do, cool ML stuff does, yeah, granted. But if you've got a uh, big insurance company or a 25-year-old legacy enterprise uh, uh, and customer whatnot system, that will be in Java. And um, for us, it means mainly faster pre-processing. That's really important. And as I said, this very reliable ecosystem. And that's why Java is a good choice for... Uh, commercial applications. I'm getting not paid. Uh, I'm not getting paid by Oracle, if you're wondering. Um, so, yeah. Now I have to warn you a bit. When is this thing I'm going to present you, Java, uh, Java and TensorFlow? When this is a, uh, is this a bad idea? This is a bad idea if you're a Java programmer and want to learn machine learning. TensorFlow is not for beginners. It's not a good platform to learn deep learning with. Uh, t uh, TensorFlow is not user friendly. And if you're a JVM guy or girl, and want to learn machine learning, um, you should start with DL4J. That is a deep learning framework that's completely focused on the virtual machine, great documentation, open source, everything you need. Great tutorials, so if you want to do deep learning on Java and you don't need TensorFlow, you don't explicitly need it, you use this. If you want other algorithms instead of uh, deep learning, I personally recommend Smile. There are many other frameworks, but Smile is the one we had uh, the best experience with. So it's very, very comprehensive, lots of algorithms, nice uh, documentation, we enjoy using it. If you want to learn uh, machine learning or deep learning on uh, Python, I also wouldn't use TensorFlow, actually, if I were you. By now, I would rather use Keras or PyTorch, much more user-friendly, you learn the important stuff. W important for you to know is TensorFlow is not smarter or faster just because it is Google, okay? A matrix multiplication is a matrix multiplication. Doesn't matter if DL4J does it, Keras, or TensorFlow. So it's not a smarter neural network because it's TensorFlow. And it actually isn't faster. In our experience, DL4J, for example, is generally faster than TensorFlow. So it's not, if you want to squeeze those last few percents out of your model, um, maybe sometimes TensorFlow is faster. You know how it is. Depends on the time of year and which version you're using and lots of other stuff. But it's not like... It's Google, it's better, okay? Um, but when can it actually make sense? So you now this is what you should note. If this uh, one or more of these reasons apply to you, then what I'm going to present you may make sense. You already have a TensorFlow project, um, and the infrastructure and other components you need in the project, uh, project are JVM-based. So we say, yeah, we have to ent interface with all this Java code anyway. Then this is a good idea. And you have TensorFlow now how? Okay, you need to know a bit about TensorFlow if you use it in a real-world project. Um, and uh, you need uh, the low-level approach of TensorFlow. This is also a reason. Okay? So maybe some of the stuff you need is not available in DL4J or something, and then you need to switch to TensorFlow. And here's f one of the best reasons where you might uh, actually use this approach when you use TensorFlow, where you might actually switch to Java, even if you don't need Java for other reasons. That is, you want to avoid the TF data uh, pipeline. That is the API TensorFlow uses for efficient uh, data loading. And in my opinion, it's a total nightmare. So it's just, it takes so much time just to uh, load simple data unless you're doing really simple Hello World stuff. So this is just a nightmare to work with. And you really want to avoid TF data. Okay, so I have to speed up a bit. So why, uh, just a quick example, I'm not just making this up because it works or something. We actually had to do this at Divisio and uh, we do all our server stuff on, uh, on the JVM and we are developing a new in-house product, has something to do with text processing, isn't really important for the case. Um, and we wanted performance and stability, so we wanted uh, JVM. And all our, we have continuous integration, all the infrastructure, everything is focused on the JVM for this kind of code. And we needed the same ETL, extract, transform, load. This is when the people talk about pipeline, machine learning, pipeline pre-processing, -pre it's this ETL code. We wanted to make sure not to duplicate this. Paul gave a talk today about the changes of that. Uh, this is why we didn't want to do this from the start. Um, and uh, now why TensorFlow? We needed state-of-the-art text preprocessing. So we needed Bir needed BERT. BERT is a very new model, September last year by Google. And um, 
BERT reference implementation is obviously in TensorFlow because it's done by Google, and BERT is not a simple model. And for reasons which are not so true anymore, it couldn't be implemented in DL4J at the time. So we, had, uh, we could either write it completely from scratch in some other framework or use the code. So we definitely had to do this. Uh, yeah, Pre-processing in Python, slow and allergen, don't do it. And uh, we have TensorFlow know-how. So ta-da, we tried to combine the two. So um, in order to understand how you achieve this, um, we need to go over three or four TensorFlow basics. I don't know, for those who know TensorFlow very well, for, uh, it will be very boring, uh, but I will try to speed up. But you need to know it in order to know what the API is presenting to you that we are going to use. So TensorFlow is actually not a deep learning framework. It's just a computation engine with automatic uh, calculation, uh, calculation of derivatives. It's just a way to organize calculations uh, in a graph. Ob obviously, the main focus is deep learning, but technically you could do other calculations with it as well. So under the hood, what you actually have is a lot of nodes that do calculations, multiply and stuff, and uh, uh, the graph automatically calculates the derivatives for you. That's the useful thing, and that's why backpropagation and stuff like that works. So uh, the whole TensorFlow architecture is far more complicated than you think. It uh, uh, has multiple little bits and pieces, but the important thing is this layer here in the middle, the C API. Everything that actually happens, the actual work in the, in the, in the engine, is wrapped by a C API. So it's not Python. You see, the Python actually happens up here. So um, the actual runtime, the stuff that does the work, is C. Or C++, I don't know. I think it's just C and some parts are C++. And the Python app we are actually using is just, a f is, is just a front end. You're not actually using TensorFlow when you use the Python code. You're using a Python API that lets you talk to TensorFlow. And the good thing is there's also a wrapper for this level in Java. Okay, so you can talk to the TensorFlow API in Java, but it is very low level. It's far, far less convenient than the Python API, and this is why you don't do, do everything in, ten, uh, in Java. You could technically do everything in Java, uh, but it's really, really hard, and you have to work on an extremely low level. But we will see that the wrapper is enough to just train and run the model, and this is what we want. So, then, why is this thing called TensorFlow? Quick reminder, what is a tensor? A tensor is basically an array, okay? A one-dimensional array, is a, or also known as a vector, would be a 1D tensor. Two-dimensional uh, tensor, also called a matrix, uh, looks like this, and you have a 3D tensor, 4D tensor, 5D tensor. I, I never encountered a 6D tensor. I think it stops at 5 when you do RNNs and batches and maybe... Th Maybe if you have 60 tensors. So um, there's a mathematical uh, background to this, oh, sorry, uh, to the whole tensors, but we won't even talk about it. For us as developers, you can just say it's an array. Okay? And this is why it's called TensorFlow. I showed you in the previous uh, uh, slide this uh, animation, how the data flows through the graph. And the data in TensorFlow is always a tensor. Everything in TensorFlow is a tensor, and it flows through the graph, hence the name TensorFlow. So we have the graph, we have the tensor. Uh, now we need to know what an operation is. I just uh, showed you that everything, the whole TensorFlow model that you built, is actually a graph. And um, we have vertices. And the vertices here, those boxes, are the operations. Here, for example, there's an add. Add. It just adds, adds two tensors together. Here we have more adds. We have a reshape. Those tensors are arrays and they can change the shape. So here's a reshape operation. So everything that you build in TensorFlow uh, is built of operations. Um, the input can be zero or more tensors. So there are nodes that have no input. For example, a constant. A constant always outputs the same value, so there's no input. Um, then you have uh, um, nodes that have multiple inputs. For example, add has two inputs and one output. So you see the add here has two inputs and one output. Um, and in, uh, what's important for us, even loading and saving in TensorFlow are tensor operations. That's everything happens in the graph. Okay. Uh, the tensors itself, they are the edges, so they flow through those edges. Every arrow here is a tensor, and we see here, um, here's an annotation of, uh, some of them are annotated in this tool I used to do the screenshot with, uh, is the size of the tensor. So we here we have a 64 by 128 tensor, so a matrix of size 64 by 128. Um, now, the last TensorFlow basic you need to know is a session. Everything, when TensorFlow actually does anything, happens in a session. 
Um, a session is what actually contains the state. The graph itself is just the structure. When TensorFlow runs, it runs in a session. And uh, a session is actually an instantiated graph. For the Java people, it's super simple. The graph is the class, the session is the object. So you take a graph, you instantiate it, all the variables in your graph, they, uh, they get state, and then you have a session, a session that contains a graph. Um, yeah, this is uh, our uh, analogy. And now we need to. Uh, we now now uh, we now know how TensorFlow works under the hood, and now we need to uh, deal a bit with file formats because they are not that simple in TensorFlow. Uh, the TF ten, uh, the TensorFlow persistence RP is really really ugly and uh, not easy to understand. And uh, I beware when you start reading this and you think I'm too stupid. I don't understand this. It's not you. Okay, we all feel that way. Um, the low-level approach to loading and saving stuff in TensorFlow, meaning triggering the nodes in the graph, in my opinion, is actually easier than dealing with all those fancy... You have three or four APIs that essentially do similar things, but not quite equal, and it's been refactored multiple times, so some of it is deprecated, some isn't, so not an easy API. Um, we have the graph definition, that's the graph itself, it's a PB file. We have the variable state, that is the content of a session, this is what we learn, and we have a metagraph. Forget about the metagraph, it's deprecated, it will be removed. And we have a checkpoint file, you can also forget about that. So, how does TensorFlow training work? We create a graph, either by calling the API and creating nodes, or by loading a PB file. Then create, we create a session for the graph, that's just one API call, uh, build the session. And then we init the variables, um, and we do this by either triggering a very special node. Every TensorFlow graph, when you build it right, has one special node that's like the constructor. And that fills all the variables with the right, uh, with the initial state, so the graph actually can run. You can either run init, or you can load an index file. And then you fill your input tensors. You just take your arrays, fill them with data. And then you say which parts of the graph you want to execute. This is important. The whole graph, if you don't tell it what to calculate, it won't do anything. You have to tell it, calculate this part of the graph, calculate that part of the graph, calculate this. If you don't specify something, the data will not flow to this target. And then you run the session. A session can be run. It has a button. You press it, basically, you can imagine like this, and the data flows once through the graph until it's done. And then you repeat, and you repeat, and you repeat. You do this again, and again, and again, and again, until your model converges, hopefully. And when you're done, you save your variables. This is how TensorFlow works and trains. So, how does uh, inference work? Inference is the process of actually using the model you have learned. You create a graph, either by creating it manually or loading a file. You create a session. You init your variables. You fill the input tensors. This time your input tensors is not stuff you learn, this is something you want to know something about. Uh, you specify the target operations, you run the session to get your result. You repeat, repeat, repeat. Notice anything? Exactly the same process. TensorFlow doesn't know if it's running or learning. It's no difference, it just calculates stuff in a graph. So. The only difference is when we run the graph, we don't save anything. So, plan of attack, how do we get it done? We have 12 more minutes to actually connect Java and TensorFlow, because actually when we do it, you will see it's totally simple. We just need four API calls. But in order to understand when to call them and what it actually does, we had to go through this. So, plan of attack. We used the Java lib provided by Google, that is a wrapper around the CI API, to load the graph and execute it. These are the methods that actually are provided in the Java API, and they're just one line. Load the graph, create a session, uh, run the graph. Uh, the persistence, the loading and saving, this is the stuff that we, in TensorFlow we normally do with the Python API. We simply use low-level operations. This is the trick. This is the one trick you need to know which nodes to trigger so actually the loading and saving uh, happens. If you maybe are uh, any Rick and Morty fans here, maybe? A lot of nerds, yeah? The episode where he opens the cockroach's head and touches the stuff in the brain and the cockroach mo moves, this is how we load and save in TensorFlow. Um, our cockroach is just TensorFlow. Nice image there. Um, then we create our tensors from Java arrays. This is what the wrapper also does for it. It's one call, take an array, make a tensor out of it, and that's it. So, now, I hope you don't feel cheated. There's one thing we still have to do in Python, and this is defining the initial graph. If 
you are a masochist or really, really curious, you can try that with the Java API. But there are so many utilities, so many wiring that happens in the graph that you need the Python API for it. But you only need to do this once. You do it separately in a different Python file just once. You build the graph and save it once. From there on, you make a normal Java or Kotlin or whatever project with a Maven dependency. You write your pre-processing code, just normal Java code like you would always do, and then you load the graph that you created in the first step. This is now a PP fi PB file that we can just load. Uh, we create a session, we load uh, the variables, and then we put Java errors in tensors, we run the session, we read the results. Repeat. So it's basically the same loop that you do if you follow a normal TensorFlow tutorial with session feeding. That's exactly every step we do in Python, we do in Java. So it's the same process. And when we are done training, so we only do it in training, we all, all, uh, also save the variables. So that's all for slides. We have 10 minutes now. I just show you in an MNIST project how uh, we did this. I gave this talk before at another conference. I showed a real-world project and people complained because in real world, it, if it's not MNIST, things get more complicated. So I hope you don't mind. If you want to see some real code after that, I can show you another project which is a bit more complicated, but the principle is the same. So let's look. Wait a second. Nine minutes. Um, I need to switch the... I need to mirror. Okay. This works. Okay, everybody can see it. All right, there we are. And uh, wait, wait, wait. Enter presentation mode. Okay. So we start with a. Uh, I, I will not show you how the Python code looks like because it looks like any other TensorFlow Python code. Okay? You just make an MNIST graph and save it. It's, you just Google MNIST tutorial uh, TensorFlow and that's what it is. Um, so what we do to make things a little easier, here's some inheritance, I hope you don't mind, I, we didn't overdo it enterprise-wise. Um, there is, wait, 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 one base class that where we implemented the TensorFlow stuff that is always the same. Um, and here is the initial code. This is one th the thing you need to do, you just create a graph ob object and it's totally simple you need to create an empty graph object, that's it. Here's a thing that's a bit special, you need to load the, uh, the PB file. Uh, PB actually is not a file extension that means TensorFlow graph, it's a file extension that means protobuf. Google saves everything it can in its own file format, which is not that bad, it's a protobuf, it's, it's like a binary JSON. And um, in order to load that, you need the actual bytes because the CRP can load protobuf, but it needs a byte array. So we simply uh, load the bytes. In this case, I, what I prefer, this is a tip, the PB files are not large, I would add them as Java resources yeah. to your Java file, like you would any kind of resource in a normal project. And then you just tell uh, your new empty graph to import the graph dev. And then your empty graph suddenly becomes the graph you have created in TensorFlow, and your graph now lives in, in, uh, in in your JVM. Actually, I think it's off heap memory, but yeah, details, details. Then the next step is you need to, to create a session. We said a session is always connected to a graph, so this is a simple constructor as well. We simply pass it this graph object. We just put it in there and then we have a session for the graph. This thing is a bit special. Uh, when you want to do some debugging, you can uh, set flags in TensorFlow, a configuration of a TensorFlow session. And uh, you do this in Python with an object. It's just a typical Python object with keys and values. And if you want to do that yourself, you need to build such a builder. You see the thing that this is also a proto, a protobuf object, so you actually create a protobuf file and then immediately turn it into a byte array. So it basically works like a graph dev. Um, yeah, and that's actually already it. This is how you load uh, uh, your instance. Now, here comes uh, something else. You always start with, uh, uh, now we have a graph, we have a session, but we are not initialized yet. You have two choices. You could init the graph by calling the graph node. We don't do this because in training, you always want to resume from a last checkpoint. So when we write uh, the TensorFlow model, we also write the, uh, the index files. I will show you that in a moment. And we load the variable state as well. We always load the variable state. And here we see our first interaction with a TensorFlow API for tensors and running the graph. This is how everything we do from now on will work. 
we have this tensors class, which is just a class full of static method to create tensors. And I told you that everything in TensorFlow is a tensor, so even the string is a tensor. So what we do in order to load the file, we take the bra path prefix. This is something you have to figure out by testing. Uh, uh, it's just you remove the index suffix. Remember that? And then you create a string tensor. And this string tensor is then fed into the runner. This is Kotlin code. I will tell you in a moment what it does. Um, when you would do this in Java, you've got to make sure that everything you create is deleted. We are not using used to delete anything because we have garbage collection, but TensorFlow obviously does its own memory management. So everything we do with TensorFlow needs to be cleaned up later. It's like uh, closing an input stream. And you've got to uh, make really, really sure that every tensor is actually uh, closed, because if you don't, you get a memory leak very fast. For example, this we use this the project we used this for trains for four days and if you have a memory leak in there, you can't train for four days. It will crash before that. And uh, this is uh, simply Kotlin API. Use means the thing I call use on will be called later. It's like a finally where you say, and when you are done, call finally. So basically, just think this is, if you, if you move the use at the end and just call it finally, it will be a finally block that closes everything. Um, this is why we use uh, Kotlin, because it just makes these things so much easier. This is harder in Java to do, it makes, takes more code. And then we have our session that we created, and I told you that the session, session needs to be run. This is actually what happens in this line, it's the exact same thing that happens in Python. So if you have a look at the TensorFlow tutorials, at the normal session feeding API, this is the exact same things. It's also called a session runner, and what we do is, we feed our tensor, into the graph. I will show you this uh, in a moment. It's actually what we can do is we give the, uh, the TensorFlow session the name of a node and the value of the tensor that goes into the node. And then at the end we tell it which target to run. In our case it's the node that restores everything and then we run it. So this is the same thing we will use from now on for everything. We uh, use the session, we create a runner, we feed values into it, we tell it where, uh, what to do with those values, and we call run. And uh, those magic values here, the names of the node, they should be printed out when you create the TensorFlow graph. I, will, I think I will quickly show you how we... Uh, maybe how do you exit this? Uh, I really... There is no, uh, no shortcut for exiting the presentation mode. That's uh, not none that I know of. Okay. If you know one, tell me. Um, so, this is a very simple MNIST tutorial in TensorFlow. And uh, when I build a node that I actually need, I simply print it to the command line. That's really simple. You need to have the names of the nodes because everything, when you interact with the C app API, you have to tell it, when you uh, want to run a target, the C API has to know which one. And you have to get the names of the, of the tensors and the nodes that you're running. So you simply, when you, uh, this is how you save in with, this is one of the many ways to save in TensorFlow. And uh, here, you have to get the tensors of the saving and the restore operations because those are names that are automatically generated and it's hard to guess them. So when you actually save your model in TensorFlow, make sure you print out the nodes that you actually want to use. The nodes where you feed in your data and get out your data, you can name yourself. Like here, the input is simply called X. So no need to print that. Uh, that is simple to do. Um, and quickly, I just want to show you one learning step and then we're actually done because there's not much to do else because then it just works. Um, wait, 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 I have to open the right one. This one. And the actual training is very simple. It's just this call. Everything you see here, uh, you see here is just complicated logging that I should clean up. Okay, forget this. This just prints something to the command line. Um, the actual training is simply this line. Again, we take the session, then we create a runner, and then we feed the TensorFlow graph everything we needed to feed. We are training, so we're training at the input, x, and the output that we expect, y. Then we set a flag that it's actually uh, training to turn on dropout, and then we say fetch, because we want something out 
we want results. And what we want is the loss and the accuracy for printing to see how well our training goes. And uh, that's it. Again, we say uh, we need to add one target because we want to train. As I said, TensorFlow doesn't know what training is actually. We have to tell it to perform an operation. And this, this one. This is just the optimizer. When you create the optimizer, you give it a name, I call it optimize, and you actually have to tell it to train, otherwise it won't train. And then you run it, and that's it. And apart from that, there's nothing else to do. There's really nothing else to do. Uh, the last thing, uh, then I'm done, I will just show you the dependencies. Because there's one thing you need to know about the dependencies, it took me a few hours to figure out, and might save you some time if you want to try this. Um, Yep, there you go. Here we are. Dependencies are very simple. It's just TensorFlow. It's in Maven Central, like we are used to. Uh, the files I showed you to add the configuration to the graph, this protobuf building, this is in a separate library. It's the TensorFlow proto library. And now the thing is, if you want GPU support, you don't have to compile anything. You have to don't, uh, don't have to do anything. You simply use this GPU dependency. And the good thing is you just go to the TensorFlow page, Google TensorFlow Java, the official TensorFlow documentation has one page dedicated to this. The, uh, these basics are on that page. So you can look it up there. This is all you need. And the good thing is, that's it for the uh, code. I don't, uh, now we are done. I have the, f uh, the summary. Um, okay, last slide. Um, Okay, we actually use this in production. You see, it's a bit to get used to if you know what a session is, running is tensors, uh, but once you have that, you just add your Maven dependency. What is good? Persistence is easier because it looked a bit weird with this use and calling a node, but it's just one line. And if you have this one line, it works reliable. It never failed. It's far, far easier than this estimator stuff you have to do in TensorFlow. You just have to understand one line. You have to understand, run the node, save to a file. That's it. It's like you want it to be. Um, the training is absolutely stable over, over multiple days. We had never one single problem with the setup. It worked really well right out of the box. So Google claims the API is not stable. We've been doing stuff like this for over a year now. Nothing has changed. So if they change a bit, it won't be much. So this is really reliable and stable in our experience. Um, what I like per personally a lot is that the, the dependencies are much easier. You don't have Anaconda environments with this numpy, uh, NumPy version and that TensorFlow release where this is, you just have one, you have the Maven dependency, everything gets in a jar, you run it on a server. All your server has to have is Java 8 and the GPU drivers, that's, that's it. Um, if you worry about performance, this is fast. I checked, the GPU is always under 100% load because you preprocess in Java. Uh, the TF data uh, pipeline doesn't do anything essentially different. So this, you have the convenience of the feeding method. If you have used TensorFlow, you have this feeding method, which is easier to use, paired with the performance of the TF data guideline. So this is really, really fast. And just writing preprocessing code in Kotlin or Java is so much easier than with TF data. And uh, so you have both. You have a fast pipeline and you have a convenient one. That's it. I will write a summary on our blog. So if you want this in more detail, in a few weeks I'll find the time, put it all together with code examples, follow our Twitter account, we'll tweet about this. Maybe it interests you. Thank you.